Hi, and welcome to the Two Pints of Maggots and Packets of Hooks podcast. You join myself, Dave, as we talk all things fishy throughout a series of new podcasts where we'll cover all different angles from talking to big names in the fishing game right the way through to testing and reviewing various pieces of tackle as well. So my name's Dave and I've been in angling now for over 30 years, which is pretty scary when I think about it. I still remember the first time that I cast a line out on my local canal and uh, got snared up with a little cheeky perch. And uh, ever since then, uh, to pardon the pun, I have been hooked. Now, not only am I an avid enthusiastic angler, but I also write a local fishing column in a paper here uh, in Lincolnshire called the Sleaford Standard. You can check that out at www.sleafordstandard.co.uk online, usually every Thursday, um, and in the press as well. Um, Alongside that, I also look after the media interests of a bait company called Teddy Fisher, .co.uk, um, covering all sorts of ground bait and boosters and additives, etc., etc. And that's all on the sideline. I would say, in general, I'm a club angler. Uh, I'm an occasional open match angler. But more than anything, I just love getting out on the bank, putting fish in the net and meeting interesting people along the way. Now, these uh, podcasts, it's not something that I'd really thought about doing before. I've been doing a couple of videos, which I really enjoy, um, over with the Teddy Fisher guys. Lots and lots to learn in that respect, in terms of editing and, and content, and etc. Um, and that's coming along nicely. And podcasts, it was actually uh, the wife. She gave me the idea and said, you know, why don't you get involved? It's, we're in lockdown um, you know, the, we can't get out as much as you'd like, so give it a go. And she's right, you know, um, if I can't go fishing, then reading about it, talking about it, watching videos, DVDs, etc., it is the next best thing. And, and actually, you know, the podcast does make sense. So there's four sections, really, that we're going to be looking at during these podcasts. Um, we're going to break it down into four areas. First of all, the press pack. Uh, we'll kick off each of these podcasts looking at the angling press over the previous month. Uh, whether it be the big names of Angling Times, Match Fishing Magazine, etc., or whether it be even something interesting that I found on social media. We can discuss, we can look at it uh, and talk about uh, what we found interesting. We're also going to have uh, the main feature of our podcast called The Big Chat, and hopefully I can get some big names lined up where we can talk about their angling careers in the past, the present and the future and uh, get some real interesting chat on the go. And I'd love your interaction on that as well. So uh, as I announce these names that are going to be joining me for the chat, um, I'd love it if you've got any questions uh, you'd like me to pose or whether, um, you know, any sort of anecdotes or stories. If you've met these individuals, they would be great as well. Third part of the show is going to be the tackle shed, and that's where we're going to uh, get a chance to look and review any bits and pieces that I found that month that I've picked up on the tackle shop shelf and thought, I'll give that a go. Whether it's good, bad, or, bad or ugly, I will let you know, that is for sure. Um, similarly, for you guys, if you've come across a piece of tackle that's really sort of transformed your fishing, um, has given you the edge or got you a few extra bites, then do let me know and I can sort of spread the word, or if it's just been a load of duff and again we can tell the world about that too finally we're going to have listeners corner and that's when it's down to you if you've popped in any requests any questions queries if you'd like me to sort of pose those questions to anybody that i can across the fishing world uh, then we'll do that so what we can do is we can cover off anything that you guys want to get involved as well so i hope you like this series i really do um it's uh, a new thing for me Um, But I'm sure I'll enjoy doing it because it's fishing related. So more than happy to get involved. So let's crack on. Let's take a look at the press pack. Okay, let's take a little look then through the various media outlets um i've been pouring over the various monthly magazines and and some social media bits and pieces and thought i'd share with you some interesting things that you might want to have a little read of Uh, kicking off with improve your course fishing it's the january february edition and uh, straight in this caught my eye on page eight um, uh, beginning the feature with a chap called phil taylor Um, he's fishing the river bain and this is literally sort of 15 minutes away from my house. And I've, I've never had the pleasure because a lot of it is um, club controlled and I'm not a member of these clubs. But in this article, Phil talks about um, a stretch of river that comes out of a little market town called Horncastle 
beautiful market town as well it is and from a way downwards this is a free fishing stretch and he talks about how it's sort of semi-urban angling and you hardly see anybody fishing yada 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 and he's catching big big roach in here and he's, he says it's not unusual to catch a number of two pound roach he's fishing like a um, a mesh feeder with bread through it there's a little map and he's got a brace of of lovely roach there now the irony behind that is um when i was in the local tackle shop not long ago we was talking about this feature and uh, i saw a couple of um, chaps chatting away on some of the Lincolnshire forums saying that they couldn't get on that stretch because there were so many anglers. So either they've all read that article the same as me and thought, oh, I'd give that a go. And all of a sudden it's it's hammered um, or it just happens to be due to the local lockdown and people have got to fish locally. They've gone on the, the nearest river, which might well have been that free stretch. So interesting, just something that caught my eye, which was quite good. Uh, and what I really liked in page 30 as well of Improve Your Course Fishing, I just skim across to that. Is a very, very good article that I enjoyed reading by Jamie Hughes. And in this article, he talks about uh, the name of the article or the feature is called Curve It Like Jamie Hughes. And what he's talking about essentially is increasing his catch rate over the years by having um, a curved pole rig when he's fishing for silver specifically as well. And what he's essentially doing is, and I get it, because if you think about a pole rig going straight down, and even your last dropper being, say, four inches from your hook. If you hold that dropper and then grab your hook and just move it around in a circle, you can see that the circumference or the turning circle, if you like, is quite large uh, where you wouldn't see a bite. And at this time of the year, when you're looking at the slightest of indications, he thinks by having that straight line in a curved fashion, almost sort of over depth, but, but pulling it up, you know, holding it tight, there's less wriggle room for uh, for the fish to move before you see an indication. It makes absolute sense. I'll definitely be giving this a little try uh, next time I'm out. Uh, he also talks about the five in five rule. And what he says here, and I'll quote, uh, eyed roach and skimmers don't want to eat much, but they're definitely triggered into feeding by bait falling through the water. I have what I call the five in five rule, and it does what it says on the tin, five maggots every five minutes. I can completely relate to that as well. Throughout this winter, I've, I've not shied away from feeding uh, loose feed over the top of my lines. Uh, it might be that I've put in some ground bait or some pellets as a, as a focal point on the bottom, but I've definitely been feeding over the top just a couple of maggots every now and then to keep bait going through the water to try and catch the eye of the fish. So absolutely on board with that. But this whole curved shotting pattern, I remember as well that he did, uh, it was a little clip online where he's doing something similar fishing the margins as well. Whereas we like to sort of pin our baits down on the deck in summer um, when fishing the margin over ground bait or loose pellets or whatever on commercials, he's almost sort of doing the same curved effect and he's dragging it up the shelf, which again means that um, I suppose it's more of a bolt rig for the fish as well. But he's definitely onto this this curve piece. So that's that was interesting as well. To be honest, improve your course fishing this, this month. Really, really good. Loads of stuff in here um, that's, that can sort of, trigger ideas and trigger the mind and i guess since i resubscribed to this quite a while ago good thing it covers everything you know having a good old read about pike fishing and predators and, and, and stuff that you wouldn't normally consider as well and it's not just it's certainly not for beginners or pleasure anglers there's loads of stuff that i've been getting out of improve your course fishing moving on to let's get the next magazine uh, match fishing magazine page 102 i found it's it's an article right towards the back you are a subscriber you pick up a, a copy of match fishing mag uh, page 102 it's always towards the rear of the magazine and it's uh, it is matt's month so matt godfrey does a usually sort of four or five pages every month towards the back where he's just great isn't he you know when you read his you see him on video he comes across fantastic very relaxed you know explains things in real layman's terms and that translates onto paper as well they're always a good read there's the, the, the sort of the right element of humour alongside the, the seriousness stuff and, and the tips to, to ensure that, you know, we can all catch a few fish based on his uh, his goings on. Um, and in this one, he's fishing uh, a mixture of a pole and a feeder on, I think it's on the, where was it, the Aaron Calder or, uh, yeah, Aaron Calder Navigation. 
So he's, he's fishing like a feeder across and, and a pole line to huge bag of silvers. Fantastic. So that's a really good read. Um, the rest of match fishing is is pretty much a much of a muchness. You know, the similar themes to the Improve Your Course Fishing one. There's quite a nice one, actually, which caught my eye. Uh, F1's with Will Raisin. And he's using hybrid elastics are all the rage at the minute. I've been using the Preston one. Uh, Dio have got a new one that he's, he's, he's talking about there. Hybrid elastic, uh, high endurance, solid elastic. And there's a white one there, 6 to 10, which is obviously similar to white hydro, I imagine. That might be worth a go. So that caught my eye too. So that's match fishing and improve your course fishing um, looked at. Uh, a couple of things online, I guess. Uh, there was an article that popped up post at the latest Angling time. So it was it was online and it's, uh, it's really stood out. There's a guy um, called, what's his name? I'll just open it up online here. Simon Daly and Roman Van. So a couple of guys that were out fishing and this guy slipped the net under a £2.15 ounce roach during a trip to the Hampshire Avon. Um, he says, after an hour of baiting a swim with hemp, casting his maggot helicopter rig over the top, Roman hooks this big roach. As it was my second largest ever roach, I cracked open the cigars. There's a great picture of him there with this wonderful looking roach with a big fat, fat cigar in his mouth there to celebrate. Why not? Good lad. Good on him. And what, what a fish that is as well. Funnily, though, that does trigger my mind into something. I had a conversation with uh, Dave Costa the other day. And he's been fishing a local water to him, and it's just around the corner from me as well, called Woodland Waters. And there's been a fair few blanks, which is unusual, but I think it's because of the weather that's up and down. You know, it's like a fiddler's elbow at the minute. So he's been trying to find a way of finding a lot of big roach in, in a couple of the lakes there. And he has been using a helicopter rig as well. He said there's been a fair few people blanking and struggling, but for some reason, a helicopter rig with a maggot feeder um, has been getting sort of half a dozen a uh, big stamp roach over a pound so that ties in with uh with this guy's trip to the to the great ooze so that's that's one to think about as well uh what else did we find online so yes in angling times this week a couple of articles that, that caught my eye now the first one very interesting straight into the paper uh page four it talks about a new wor new world events in the pipeline, as I quote this here now. Freestyle feeder and street fishing matches are set for autumn. Essentially, what this is, is as we know, um, world championship wise, we've got two formats, I guess, for course fishing. Um, one being the, the, the sort of the pole and the rod and line, the, uh, the traditional world champs, if you like. The float fishing world champs, if you want to call it that. And then we've got the feeder team. Um, now, this one is a, is a twist on that because the feeder team, I remember um, looking into the, some of the rules, the FIPS rules that they've got to fish towards. There's, there's quite a lot of stuff. You know, your hook length's got to be a certain length and it, whether it's fixed or whether it's free running, lots of rules around your rig. Well, obviously, this is a similar concept of a, of a feeder match on a world stage, but it's freestyle. So I imagine you can use a method feeder, you can have short hook lengths, you can have free running fixed, whatever it may be. Uh, I guess the clues in the name and the other one, the urban style uh, that uh, predator that so that's um, law fishing is is a whole new concept. I can only think of I know there's the Pike Championships over here and there's a few Xander competitions and stuff like that. But in terms of a world stage predator match, um, it'd be interesting to see where that's going to be located. But that's that's something new as well. So they really caught me out straight in the at the start of the paper. When I then flipped through a little bit further, if we go towards the back of the paper, page 50, an interesting article about team fishing. Um, and it talks about the headline being, um, if I can just find it, it talks about it. Can we regain, you know, what team fishing used to be like, the glory days, if you like. And I, and I suppose it's harping back to the times when there was four divisions when it came to the national championships, uh, you know, sort of 60, 70 teams per division. And obviously now we're at a stage where we've got the, the division one and the division two. We've got the commercial national as well, or the Stillwater uh, national, as it's called. So that's breeding a new type of teams, I guess. Uh, the bigger teams, you know, have got enough talent to, to enter teams into all of them, I guess. But so it says, can team fishing return? And, and the opening piece is it says, life's never been better if you're an individual match angler with a whole host of competitions to fish, offering big money and a bucket full of prestige. 
Fisher Mania, Maver Match This, Golden Reel, Golden Rod, Pat D Masters, the list goes on. But what if you're a team angler? The cupboard's a little bit bare when it comes to big events with big prizes. The National's still going strong while the Winter League struggles on. After those two, that's your lot. So what's gone wrong with team fishing? What can be done to revive its fortunes? We asked four team fishing anglers for their thoughts on why we don't seem to cheer for team fishing anymore and what needs to happen. And then you've got sort of opinions from Mark Pollard, Mark Harper, uh, Martin High and John Weed and all captains of various teams. Now, my opinion on this is um, I can harp back. I remember fishing a national when I was when I was 15 years old. It's the only one I've, I've ever fished. It was, you know, rabbits in a headlight moment. It was a division two. It was on the River Welland and Coronation Channel um, with Middleton Angling Society. And it was absolutely massive. You know, it was it was a huge event. I think there were 67 teams of, um, of 12. I remember I scored 33 points. I weighed in about 12 ounces. Um, so it was about halfway up the section. Did my bit for the team. My old mucker, Bob Price, legendary performance on the Coronation Channel. I think he finished six overall. And if you do the math, 12 anglers times 60 odd, something like, you know, 750 participants. So it was a huge event. And, and I don't know what's gone wrong from those days to, to where we are now. There's obviously uh, more of a of a sort of individual focus on things. And, it, and it's a real shame. Um, but I do think that things will change up again. I think if we get the venues where you can host those big matches again that are going to offer good sport, a lot of it's down to dwindling sport. Let's have it right. People want comfort. They want the ability to go to the toilet if they need to. They want a tackle shop on site. They want a, the car to be safe. And you just don't get that on these miles and miles of canals and riverways that are needed to host these sizes of matches. But what was really interesting was I received uh, an email from the Angling Trust not long ago because I was looking at submitting a team into the Stillwater National last year. And because I was still on their books as a registered team, they sent out a uh, survey asking what the team captain's opinions were on creating a Division 3. Um, and lots and lots of questions around the format of this. Now, bearing in mind this was sent out to, I believe, something like 200 team captains that were registered with the Angling Trust, they received 19 responses, and mine was one of them. So for match anglers to then go and complain that they're not listened to, or their opinions don't count, or that they're, you know, they're, they're discounted from the bigger picture, is just, it's just completely wrong. It's because a lot of people just can't be bothered to sort of engage with the Angling Trust and, and give those opinions. Maybe because there's some, uh, they think they're going to be ignored. I, I don't know. There might be some apathy around it, but I can certainly say I filled my bit and I give my opinions and I thought, you know, another division uh, is great. But hey-ho, um, team fishing won't grow when there's, there's apathy around, that is for sure. But I'm pretty sure at some stage it will kick off again and maybe not in those big teams of 12 and big squads and all the rest of it, but small four man, six man matches are still popular. Certainly from when I lived up in the Northwest there, the Winter League was popular on various venues. The Angling Trust Winter League was popular as well. Um, I've not seen so much here where I am now in Lincolnshire, but that's because I've not been out searching for, for team events just yet. And we've had lockdown and, and COVID. So, Interesting, interesting to think about. But uh, that's a bit of a review of the things that caught my eye in the press. So hopefully uh, you've enjoyed that. Uh, let's now move on and have a conversation in the big chat. Teddy Fisher Baits specialise in the manufacture of fishing ground bait and additives. We combine a 40-year-old proven fish catching recipe and the experience of our skilled team. Fishing is an adventure, and here at Teddy Fisher, we strive to make that adventure a success. Go to www.teddyfisher.co.uk to see our full range of baits. Okay, so we've come to the part of the show, which I think is going to be a really big feature of this series on our podcast, which is called The Big Chat. And today, our guest uh, needs no introduction whatsoever. It's none other than broadcasting legend, Mr. Keith Arthur. How are we, sir? I'm all right, thanks, mate. The, the big chat. There's no one better at chatting big than me. 
<laughs> well, it's funny because when I was um, initially writing a few thoughts on what we were going to discuss, I thought we're going to end up doing more than one. But it's for sure if we want to get through, we'd have about a whole series um, of chit chat. But to be honest, Keith, there's a little bit of a format just to give you a bit of an idea of, of you know, what we're going to chat. It's a bit of a past, present and future. So um, we can talk a little bit about how we know each other and, and sort of how you got to where you are today, I guess, and then think about what you're going to be uh, you're getting up to in the future. But how have you been in this this crazy time and this lockdown? Well, I'm all right, mate. I've managed to stay safe so far. Um, I've not been out very much, to be honest. I've got the odd domestic situation with my wife who's not very well, but that's, that's a, a different matter altogether. So I can't get out as much as I want to, but I don't want to get out because I don't want to catch it. No, 100%. And I think you've made a conscious decision to, to not fish as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, fair enough. It's crazy times, unprecedented times for sure. But we've got lots to sort of look back on anyway. And I guess for the listeners, a little bit of sort of background between between you and I, I can cast my mind back 26 years ago, if you want to if I throw that at you. It was a, a bleak November day and I'd won a competition on tight lines to have a day's fishing with you. Mm. And I, I still remember that day where I was stood outside the freezing cold outside Gilda's Sackle Shot, which is no longer there anymore, back up in Manchester. And uh, we struggled, to say the least. What do you remember of that day? Um, well, I remember that um, Julia Hunter, who was our producer at the time, um, came from Failsworth. Uh, so, so we were able to visit her mum, which was a bit of luck. <laughs> That's a bonus. Do you yeah. get any tea? <laughs> oh, yeah. And cake. Um, <laughs> Good. And and I remember, as you say, it wasn't a very nice day. It wasn't a very pleasant day. And we went to Alexandra Park Lake. We did. Um, which is, um, some. Uh, there was an occurrence while we were fishing that I'd seen before, and we weren't going to catch anything. Um, but because I'd seen, I, I'd, I'd been in exactly the same situation as we were in that day, I was able to catch something. Um, yeah. And I remember seeing, out in the middle of the lake, fish topping. Just the odd one. Yeah. So I put a great big waggler on, put it three feet deep, cast out, went under and I caught one. I remember, and I remember it kept going under and I kept catching them. And, and that's happened to me several times. I mean, there was no way you could get in. You may have been able to catapult a ball of ground bait out there, but there was no way we were going to get any loose feet out there. It was a real long way. Yeah. They were just there. And um, I had that once on TV um, doing something. Remember the big breakfast? I do. Oh, Chris yeah. Evans. And yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It, Chris Evans was off. Paul Ross was actually doing it. And the mm-hmm. family of the week wanted to go fishing. And and they were, they were actually down on the lower River Lee. It's the part of the Lee navigation where it be- becomes a heart's navigation before it runs into um, the sea and through the docks and into the sea. And I went down. I'd never been there before. And um, th- there were fish topping against a narrow boat that was moored up a long way away on the far bank. And I caught some over there. Eventually, we caught some on Chopworm close in as well. Uh, but the most yeah. memorable bit for me of that day, is very nice family of the week, lovely people, got really looked after while I was there, had my team diver suit and all the rest of it. And um, <laughs> But uh, you remember the, the great Robert Palmer record, Addicted to Love? Oh, yeah, yeah. You remember the ladies in the... Ladies on the guitar. Right. Yeah. Well, Paul Ross was doing it live with those ladies on that day. That's a bonus. The only well, except he wasn't there to rehearse it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I was Robert Palmer and Paul Ross rehearsing "Addicted to Love" with these gorgeous ladies who were miming to the track like they were in the video. Of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I've I've done that. That's a claim to fame, mate, isn't it? And it just I've done addicted to better. love with those girls. The lights Is are it? on. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit better than being stuck on Alexandra Park Lake with me. Yeah, that was for it sure. Was different. It was different. Yeah, crikey, that does take us back. And I guess since then, um, crikey, I guess we kept in touch with Violetta back in the day, then emails, and yeah. then now it's easy. We can just have a chat over Facebook and whatnot, can't we? For sure. How time flies, Keith. Mm. Crazy. Well, I guess if it's casting our minds back a little bit, then let's think about the, the past piece, if you like. Um, I think I know a few things about you that the listeners might not. But let's just think about... Um, I might not as well. <laughs> no, in terms of where you started fishing and oh, where yeah. you grew up. So I know you're from London for a start. I know you're a big gooner for a second thing. But I don't really know where you used to sort of wet a line as a kid. 
Oh, well, well I, I come from Holloway in North London, which is um, it, it, it's it was in the same postcode as the new Arsenal Stadium. It, it was N seven. Well, it still is N seven, but uh, they've they've made um, Arsenal Stadium back in M five again, like it always was at the beginning. The Emirates Stadium is, is I still call it Ivory. Forgive me. Um, so I, I I didn't need to read the paper to know the score. I could tell the score by listening and um my dad was a season ticket holder as was my my maternal grandfather and they used to go but I never ever went to football with him I went on my own and I saw the first game when I was eight um Arsenal reserves versus Northampton Town reserves and it was a tanner to get in and threatens for a program that was a piece of cardboard anyway where did I start fishing That's a memory yeah, yeah. Where, where did I start fishing it was um Hampstead Heath Parliament Hill Fields that sort of area Finsbury Park Lake um, there were those old terrapins in there. Finsbury Park. Well, like, there are, terrapins there, there probably are now. Yeah, and and but when I went there, there, there were you could fish all around the lake, and um, there was a, a local uh, local bloke who who was sort of a regular who you went and watched and tried to catch what he caught, and there was a a park keeper called Rubberneck. Who had a, uh, he had one of these, you know, he had, he had a bent neck, basically. And, um, and a few rubber neckers, yeah. Yeah, we used to get over the fence and he'd come and chase us and we'd give him some lip. And and the New River ran through um, Finsbury Park in those days, which was the New River carried water from the headwaters of the River Lee down to the, the, the East London Reservoirs. And it was full of big roach back in the day. You weren't allowed to fish there. And if you were caught with any tackle or especially any bait, you were in trouble. So we used to use chewed up fag packets for bait. <laughs> uh, fag, not uh, fag paper so we put a, riz- a couple of rizzles in there I'd chew them until they became like paste put them on a hook on a hand line and drop them off the bridge and you caught yeah I catch roach like that but that was that was i was older than um, than sort of when i started but no one in my family went fishing so it was apart from my my maternal grandmother's father he went fishing. He he fished in Plymouth Dockyard. They come from Plymouth, my mother's family, and wow. um, yeah. So he used to catch conger eels on hand lines. But I never I never met him. Never went fishing with him. But but I'm a baby boomer. Don't forget. I was born in '46, and there were loads of us around at the same time. And we all went fishing together. We all grew up fishing together. I'm still mates with a couple of them. And Billy Allen's still my best mate in the world. And um, you know, we we still fish together occasionally. So how did that then lead into the whole? the tackle game was it just a natural evolution where you wanted to work in tackle i mean tell the listeners about i suppose um i know about your days as a daiwa rep i know about your time at was it acton yeah at the before, time as well? before that i was, I, was then? I, I went to a very very good school um an excellent school that produces lots of of pupils that go to oxbridge um i wasn't one of those uh, because i wanted to go to work and it was it was a, the, it was the, the top non fee fee paying grammar school in London and the South East. And um, it was based at the Angel in Islington, which was handy because when I bunked off, the canal was just across the road. Yeah, it's um, just there, yeah. Yeah, so I could go there. But but my mate Bill worked. He was a carpet fitter and he earned a lot of money. He had a, he had a new car. When new cars came out, he had one and, and, and he had a Jag Mark too. And I wanted to be like him. So I helped him out sometimes on Saturday and then I left school as soon as I could and uh, started learning how to fit carpets. Um, the short version, that started wearing me knees out. I had a row with a mm. governor um, one snowy Saturday, so I handed him my notice and went to work for a furniture company as a junior salesman specialising in carpets and, and stock keeper. So I did that, and I worked up in there to be a manager of, of quite a big branch, um, and then I got fed up with being a manager of a big branch uh, because I wasn't earning enough money, went back to being a salesman in a bigger branch where I could earn more money, and then got offered a job running a tackle shop in East London, George's Tackle in Mare Street, Hackney. So I went and did that for a, a couple of years. He then bought another shop in South London, and I went across to South London to manage that. Um, then that got sold underneath me, actually, which, which put me off a bit. And, and ironically, it got sold to the man who now owns Mainline Baits. How Is that about? right? Yeah. And, and, and he walked in. I didn't know him from Adam. He said, hello, mate, I'm your new boss. I said, what do you mean, new boss? He said, I've just bought the shop. I said, okay, okay, then here's the keys and went home. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember, I, I seem to remember us having a conversation years ago about, so there's some similarities with my old man. He used to be a carpet fitter oh, yeah. and his, his knees were on his way out. And then, I, do you remember me telling you a story about he worked at a furniture place as well called Waring and Gillows? Waring, I know Waring and Gillows, yeah, Waring yeah. and shop in, East, in London, yeah. Yeah, well, he was in the Manchester, Manchester branch for yeah. years doing bits and pieces. So, yeah, I think I remember we talking about it years ago. So then I guess um, tackle trade and then moving into to the old reps game, I guess, because when I, when I think about... When I think about you, if I to associate you with a tackle company, although I know you're quite sort of 
agnostic, if that's the right word. Um, I think Daiwa and Drennan. Yeah. Well, well, I started. Um, I, le- I left. The, I was reasonably good at match fishing. I, I started match fishing in. in I joined a club in 62. That was my first competitive fishing when I was 16, 17. Uh, then I was there at the beginning of the famous Terrapins. We, we formed those and we were a London match club, which means we fished to London rules, which restricted us a lot in open matches. Got fed up with that, started fishing open matches, got a bit of a reputation as a match angler um, and, and then became sort of known as a specialist match angler. Left um, Ladywell Tackle, went to work for, for Jimmy Miles at Acton Angling Centre, uh, opened a couple of new branches for him, got, sort of quadrupled his turnover in the first three years, and, and, and everything was nice there. Then um, I got a call from John Middleton, who was then the boss at Diver, said, we've got a vacancy, come for an interview. I thought, brilliant, that's what I want. What year are we talking about here then? This was um, 89. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd already started to make the odd video, but anyway, it was 89. So uh, I went for the interview and didn't get the job. <laughs> All right, and he... he, he, he singled you out for it yeah yeah oh well, that's good um anyway I, I then started making these videos for clean river the first ones were well, i made in ireland i made them um, i made i was there i was i'll tell you exactly when it was I remember the one on the ban right that, it was the urn the urn outside lakeland forum yeah yeah and and um I, I filmed two a mark downs film too and the second of mark downs um videos was filmed on the day of the hillsborough disaster which is how i'll never ever ever forget it because i went up to the chuck wagon we had a van that cooked us food and did stuff i went up to that uh the bloke running that and supposed to be cooking our lunch was stoned and um he was asleep on the there was a sort of sleeping bit above the driver's cab he was a kip in there so um uh, I put the radio on to listen to the football and heard it happen on the radio that's that's anyway that's to cut a story short um, I then went to work for them, Clean River Fishing, worked there for six months, and Diver came back and offered me a job, a different job, a different area. So I joined them, and I was with them for five years. Yeah. Yeah, no. And I guess that got you out and about meeting loads and loads of people. Yeah. Um, what was your territory, if you like? Oh, was mate. It, regional? It, it, it's <laughs> Well, I, I, live in, I live in Richmond in southwest London. Now, it's, it wasn't southwest London. It was Surrey, but it's now southwest London. And uh, my first territory went from... Avon, when it was a county, so um, Bristol, Bristol yeah. uh, to Lincolnshire. Where I am, long yes, way. Yes, right across the country. And then um, Robin Morley came and joined the company, and he took the western half of my territory and left me with the eastern half. So I was, I was eventually Essex, Suffolk, Norfolk, Cambridge, um, Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire, that might be Huntingdonshire. Yeah, that kind of area. So it was, it was a big patch, huge patch. I mean, I could leave home and have to drive 180 miles to my first call yeah. if I was going to sort of Mansfield Angling and see I mean, Mansfield Angling. I'd walk in there and see John Dean running the shop <laughs> and, Colin, and Colin Perry. You know? now, am I right in thinking that he, I think you told me once about, he, was he not one of the greatest float makers ever? Um, or one of the greatest stick float anglers. I remember yeah, you telling me yeah, about he, some he of his stuff. He, he was as good a stick float angler as it gets, and I mean, I, I fancy myself as a stick float angler. I always fancied having, I, I could hold my own on on the stick. Um, but it, it because he fished the Trent, and and he was good on the Wagner as well, by the way. And and I fished many different rivers, so I had to develop lots of different techniques on on the stick. I I, I tried to make it work wherever I went, uh, because I preferred to fish that to any other way. And I've, I'm one of those people that when I go on a match, if I've got to try and win it, then I will try and win it. But I go match fishing to enjoy it. I enjoy matches. And, and uh, you know, sometimes I'll enjoy holding out for one chub. But anyway, that's, that's a different thing. <laughs> not, not as good <laughs> as the Leeds folks. But, but anyway, back back to the story. So, yeah, um, I, I, I would meet people like that going around. And in Essex, I'd see Steve O'Rourke and Richard Banbury and, and, and Dave Beecroft um, um in 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 notting in cambridgeshire uh, and and i'd go into to jerry's of nottingham and and north i simon woodliffe was running the shop then and of course all the trentmen would be coming in there i'd go to what's it's and bump into frank barlow i'd barlow, go to yeah. matchman suppliers and see tim applin and and you know just mixing with those people gave me a, a i already had a huge love of the trent and i'd already met most of them through my fishing and and 
I knew them as anglers and, and lucky enough, I'd won a few matches on the Trent and, and, and framed a few times. So they respected my ability and, and I respected theirs. And, and we had a really wonderful relationship, a fantastic relationship with those people in Nottingham, you know, and, and, uh, and Yorkshire as well to an extent. We had a few Manx come down there as well, didn't we? A few yeah. Manx unions used to go down to the Trent. And, yeah, uh, they did. Yeah. It was, it was a great circuit, mate. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I used to go to the, the Thursday Opens at, at Burton Joyce, the Thursday Opens. Then in, in then they moved them in at certain times of year. They'd go on to home Pierpont and I'd fish there and get 15 pound a roach and, you know, think nothing of it oh, yeah um, yeah absolutely i remember I, I used to do it myself as a kid and it were, wasn't much fun three of us sort of stuck in a in a fiat punso going going over woodhead pass mm. um but when you got there it, it was like you know it was like the wembley of of river three, fishing in some respects three of us in um, one nissan stands are going up the m1 <laughs> exactly yeah exactly the same you, do it now, now you, you got a van and you can't fit your gear in it yeah. never mind another passenger can't fit your own yeah. gear in well, well, did all this then lead on to the whole, how did the broadcasting side of things go? I mean, was it by default or was it by accident? How did well, it sort of come the about? Videos were by, were by accident because uh, I repl- I was a last minute sub for Dennis White. Um, Dennis um, White was going to do those videos in Ireland and he pulled out um, more or less last minute. So I got into that. They thought I was reasonably good at it. So they we did some more videos together. Then I went and worked for them for a few months before I got the diver job. And I was sort of their technical director. I, I, David Hall was the actual director and he, he would direct on the bank. Mickey Shepard was the producer and I'd go and do the treatment. So I'd go and meet the young Dave Roper, for example. I went up to meet him up by the Lancaster Canal. And we Lancaster, sat and had, yeah. Yeah, we, we sat and had a rabbit pie. <laughs> uh, 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 rabbit pie and chips at Wood Plumpton in the pub there. And, and I, I did his the treatment for his video. Treatment is like like a storyboard, if you like. Yeah. So, I, I, so I was doing that. So, yeah, that was really cool. Again, I met some fantastic anglers through that. Great, you know, Jan Porter and, and all manner of people we worked with. I mean, Bob Nudd, I, I knew Bob anyway through matches in the 70s when he was first starting his match fishing career. So, yeah, I got to know those people and, and I enjoyed videos. Um, I, I, I found it very easy to talk to the camera um, because I don't like showing off. I, I'm not very good at showing off but i can be someone else i don't mind standing up in front of a crowd and singing i don't mind standing up in front of a crowd and talking but i have to disassociate myself from me i have to be someone else so i could do that i could look at a camera and talk to it like it was a person and and i look at a microphone and talk to it like it's me mate and apparently that's that's a gift bruno brooks told me that is a great gift to work with bruno i mean some of the people i've been fishing with you i remember yeah yeah yeah. so and, and so that was that. Anyway, um, I got asked by a company called um, Wire TV to do a program from them, and they were broadcasting from Bristol. And I couldn't get there because I was working for Diver. This was in um, 1993. And they kept phoning, they phoned me 12 times. And I said, no, mate, you're in Bristol. You know, I'm just coming home from a day in Nottingham. I can't drive to Bristol now. Anyway, one um, Thursday night, I was driving home, got to Chiswick Roundabout, I was going to pick my wife up, actually. She we, she was, her parents live where I live now, where we live now, and we lived in Wimbledon. She used to come over all day to look after her parents who weren't very well, and then we'd go home to Wimbledon. So I was driving home to here, and on Chiswick Roundabout, mobile phone to about, my phone rang, could pick her up and answer them then. So I picked her, yeah, yeah. hello, mate, it's Darren Williams from Chrysalis TV. Listen, I'm really in the shit. Um, that work can get out. I've heard it on Radio Radio 5, so it's all right. I'm really in the poo-poo. Um, I've been let down by a guest. Can't come in tonight, can you? I said, mate, you're in Bristol. No, no. He said, we've moved now. We're in Camden Town in northwest London, where, you know, I- I've won several matches in Camden Town and, and environment. Yeah, on the old region. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I knew exactly where they were. They were just up the road from MTV. So where, where um, TVAM started. And we're just up the road from the outside, exactly where they were. I said, well, I think so, mate, but I'll have to come in with work clothes. Well, what are you wearing? I said, oh, I've got a blazer and a tie. Yeah, that's all right. So I went home. Um, Time where I thought I was going to go to this thing, drove there, went in, and Nicky Horn was the presenter. And at the time, he was presenting basketball on Radio Four on BBC on Channel Four, which is an unlikely thing because Nicky Horn is about five foot tall. And, and, <laughs> the irony. Yeah, you could see him interviewing basketball players. He almost couldn't hold the mic high enough, 
Um, but anyway, he was he was doing that, and he's a well known DJ. And he got me into some. He got me into Dire Straits and Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band before I ever knew I was going to work him. Well, I was going to be working with. So it was great to work with him. Worked some other great presenters as well. Mark Webster is on Talksport Two quite a bit. I bump into Webbo when I go in there occasionally. Um, a lovely lady called Kate Bellamy who's left the industry now and is living the, the lovely life in Scotland. And we had to, used to have some good tricks with her. And Wire TV was actually a consortium of um, cable service providers, people like Telly West, United Artists, etc. And and they were putting out these programs during the day like american chat shows a bit of cable uh, a bit of um shopping tv overnight a little bit of softcore porn sometimes overnight and, and they were repeating the programs like six hour block of programs being repeated four times and this program was called fisherman's tales and and they asked me to go back and i finished up having a regular bi-weekly slot with me and dave bird so ah, Dave yep. Bird would do one week and I'd do the next week. And if they had, sometimes they'd have half hour to fill. They found out, you can't come in tonight, I'll pass nine, can you? Yeah, of course. I, 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 and, and mate, I'll tell you something. Anybody wants advice about how to get on in life, say yes. <laughs> and say you're still yes. doing the Daiwa gig alongside? Say yes as often as you can. Well, it's only getting 50 quid. Ah, okay. Right. Yeah, fair but, enough. But say yes as often as you can to everything. So, yeah, of course I can, no problem. And whatever the problem was, it wouldn't be a problem. You know, I'd drive in and I'd do the show. Anyway, um, I'd done that for a year. And then uh, YTV got notice that um, Sky Sports were opening Sky Sports 2 and they were going, they wanted to buy Sportswire, this six hour evening program called Sportswire. They wanted to buy their programs. They had Speedway, they had Karate, they had. Um, English basketball, which was, and as Benny Asher's one sent, it was in its infantry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Typical Northern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it only just started English basketball, then Manchester Thunder, I think, whatever it was. Anyway, um, so, but the, the producer, a man called Alan Herndall, said to me, don't worry, Sky are going to take on the fishing show. And I said, yeah, right, they're going to have me on it, and they? Like, they, they might take, they'll have Nicky, but they won't have me. Anyway, about um, it closed. We, we walked out the studio very sadly, put a, a, a gone fishing sign on the door and closed it so the camera had the gone fishing sign. And I'd met some people there, people like I'd sat and spoken for 15 minutes to Freddie Truman about cricket. I was there. This is gospel wow. truth. I was there when Craig Johnson showed his predator boot invention. Yeah, I remember uh, Crikey, yeah, uh, yes, with, absolutely. He, he did a huge sort of promo, didn't he? On with them? bike tire glued, bits of bicycle tire glued across the top of a football boot <laughs> to, to yes, demonstrate. That, yes, that was what it was, and, and that was what it what that was the prototype. And so I, I met some fantastic people there. Anyway, I got a phone call, Alan Herndle. Hello, Keith. Yeah, um, Sky want you. Can you go in and meet um, Vic Wakeling, please? Oh, this is crazy. So it's going to be me, Andy Gray, and Richard Keys on 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 Sky Sports. This was the launch of Sky Sports too. I thought, God, this this ain't happening. So I went and I spoke to him. He said, "Yeah, we, we want you to do it. Chrysalis TV are going to be um, producing it like they do now, but you'll be working for them, and we want you to go. You know, we want you to do every week and that." that. So I said to my boss at Dara, "I said, great news. I'm going to be on telly every week." And to cut a long story short, he didn't like that idea. So I had, I had to leave. I didn't want to leave. I was in tears when I left. Um, I got advice from some great friends, people like Sandra Scottorn, as she is now, Sandra Halkin Hunt, and, and, and various people in the tackle industry that I knew, Les Beecroft. I mentioned Dave Beecroft earlier. That's Dave, that's Les's son, Les Beecroft. Jack Simpson, who had Simpsons at Turnford. And I said, go for it, mate. Tackle, tackle trade is okay, but it's dying. You know, it, it, it's it's on its way. It was 1994, 90, 95. So well, any, I'm just thinking some of those London tackle shops you've mentioned have, have long, long gone out. They've, so they've all gone. You mentioned Gilders. How, how many of the old tackle shops are still around? So so I left. And um, I started on Sky and I was on um, 100 quid a show. Yeah. And I, I was doing work for Angling Times as well, which was 40 quid a week. So how was, many years is that now then, Angling not, Times? I, I was start, started with Angling Times in 1990. So I'd done some bits and pieces there from him before, is. but I'd, I've had a regular column since 1990. And I've, I've been right. I started writing for David Hall's magazines in 79. Um, 
a long time ago. So anyway, I've, I've got this gig, and, and, and Andy Story was, uh, sorry, Darren Williams was a producer. He said, I'll try and get you a bit more. But, you know, we'll try and get a bit of filming during the week. I can get you 50 quid for a day's filming. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I took a gamble, and um, and it paid off, really. Um, I'd, I'd been there for about 18 months, and I I'd, I'd turned down Fishermania 2. Um, I just tight line started in 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 um, August of that year, and Fishermania then was on August Bank Holiday, Saturday, and yeah. Mark Pierman, who was the producer of Fishermania that year, phoned me and said, "Oh, can you do um, Fishermania?" I said, "Oh, sorry, mate, I'm fishing a match." <laughs> <laughs> is, that what, is that what happened? Oh, it's John yeah. Smith's weekend, isn't it? Of course it is. Of course fishing, it is. Yeah. I'm fishing the Smiths. So yes. it's, oh, no problem. So Andy Little did it because Andy Little had done some fishing on Sky before I had. Not tight lines. It was a completely different program. So so Andy did that Fishermania in 1995. Um, I, 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 I've done 96 and ever since and managed because uh, I persuaded Barry Hearn to not have Fishermania on August Bank Holiday. <laughs> is that your doing, is it? Yeah, you need yeah, to well, move it from that. How, how, how silly. You know, when you've got... As many anglers go to to Eversham to watch, won't be watching tight. Won't be. Ah, watching you want them around the bank at Cudmore right. or so wherever. Yeah. yeah. And, and Barry obviously trusted my judgment because he, he then invited me over to his office. I had no reason. I had no idea why. And um, it, when his office was in Romford, and he called me upstairs. Right, he said. Um, oh, uh, he came down to meet me, and there was a guy from Lab Brooks. We knew. Oh, this is so and so. You'll probably be working with him. I said, All oh. right. Hello, nice to meet you. Went upstairs. Well, a cup of tea. He had a cup of tea. And um, he said, right, who's your governor? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, who do you work for? I said, well, I don't work for anybody who work for me. He said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I've got this bit of income here and this bit of it. He said, well, how much do you earn total? This was this was February 97. I said, well, I don't know, about 25 grand a, what, 25 grand a year, which is about what I was earning for Diver. Only I had a company car then. He said, right, here's the deal. You keep the first 25 grand you get. Mm-hmm. Everything else you earn, I want 20% of. If you don't earn 60 grand a year, we shake hands and walk away. So it didn't take me long. I'm quite good at mental arithmetic. It didn't take me long to know I couldn't lose. Yeah. So I signed on the document. Sounds a win win. Absolutely. Yeah, this huge 35 page document to sign contract. And luckily, one of my wife's friends, Pauline Russell, her husband was George Michael's solicitor. So, so I had someone, someone reasonably au fait with the entertainment industry to go to. Yeah, just a bit. Yeah, can, you know, can you, Tony, can you have a look at this for me? He said, yeah, of course I will. He said, yeah, it's all right. He said, you don't want that bit. He said, you want to change that? He said, you want to change that? You want to change that? So I phoned up Steve Dawson, who was Matchroom's financial director, and said, well, there's a couple of things I want to change. He said, look, just change what you want. Just sign the effing thing. <laughs> so Just do it. Yeah. So so then I, I became, you know, um, a partner with Steve Davis. We, we were working for the same man. And um, it, it worked out really successfully. I mean, I I couldn't have hoped. I mean, I, I'm I'm not not gloating i've i've never ever asked for money for myself i hate asking for money if i i won't lend people money because i can never ask for it back i will give it to them yeah so, so i hate asking for people to pay me or anything so barry did all that and and for a, quite a few years i was earning more than the prime minister <laughs> I don't, well i don't even know what he earns so i wouldn't even like to guess well, but yeah to, well, let's, let's put it this way I was, okay. I was earning more money than the prime minister and i actually earned it yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, I hear so you. yeah so so I, you know it, it was it was a great gig it really was a great gig and i met some fantastic people i've still I'm, i was talking to a couple of girls on on facebook yesterday that i used to work with pippa who used to run all the outside bookings and Gemma, who worked for tight lines for years Gemma melvin and and eventually tight lines went in-house they sat chrysalis took it in-house sat, uh, bruno left uh, and, and i became the man i became the man i became the presenter and, so uh, I want to cast my mind back there then, because yeah. I'm thinking I came down to Isleworth to watch yeah. one of the shows being filmed. Bruno was still host. I want to say 2000. Yeah, probably. So when you become, yeah, you became the main man 2003. 2003, yeah. No, no, okay, quick, we started quick the season question. Two thousand three. Go on. Uh, because I know you've got an encyclopedic memory. Oh, God. How many series, how many shows? Uh, well, it, 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 it ran for 19 years and 11 months. 
Not that I'm bitter about ma- that month that would have made it 20 <laughs> no, years. Of course so, not. No, yeah, no, that's... that's, that's You've got your carriage clock. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, so I'm not bitter about that at all. Um, but yeah, 19 years and 11 months um, to the day. Um, I've no idea how many shows because we did um, some... At the start, we were, only, we were working seasonally. So we were doing 38, 40 shows a year. Then when it went in-house, it was 52 weeks of the year. So... It, it it probably wasn't a thousand, but it was you know nine hundred and some. Half you, yeah, and, and and I was never off sick. No, well, I had to, I had to, you know, I to, sick, yeah, yeah, I I had to work. I to, obviously had the occasional holiday, and um, I had to go six of those years. But I had to go from Mauritius to Mauritius for ten days before <laughs> Christmas and film. That was a that was Nothing a nightmare. to do with Marlin, was it? Yeah, yeah, Marlin World Cup. Yeah, and I had oh. to do that, and I went to New York What's for it? the Shark Cup a couple of times. Um, but I, I I tried not to miss any shows, um, not because I was worried about missing them, but I I, I enjoyed doing it. I really I don't tell anyone, but I'd have done it for nothing. <laughs> Barry, Hearn, Barry Hearn wouldn't have let me do it for nothing because twenty percent no. of nothing isn't a whole lot. It's but, no good to him. Yeah. No, no, no. But no, but I would have done it if, if they said to me, "Look, Keith, that, that you've had a really good twenty years. Would you do us a year for nothing just to keep the show on the road?" I said, "Yeah, of course." I, I would have said yes, yes, yes. And I even had um, a plan for I had the format for another program to replace Tight Lines, um, mm-hmm. but I don't think our producer at the time really fancied it. And I don't think he put the case for it good enough. And and I told a few people about it and um <laughs> and on the bank appeared. <laughs> oh well they oh crikey. Is that it, right? It was a it was a similar format to that, yeah, because you know, bear in mind we had over five hundred films in archive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 over five hundred films in the um the digital archive as well. So some, but, but I reckon two thirds of them. Uh, sorry, I reckon. Yeah, I reckon two thirds of them were viable, but a third of them were date specific, like covering certain events. Like you know, you could show the Park Dean Masters again, but it wouldn't have the same relevance. But going fishing with Dean Macy at Rochford Lakes would have had a relevance. So you know, we, we had there was a lot of, of of library, and what I wanted to do was what I wanted to do was do one show from the bank every week and record links to what we were going to fill the hour up with. So we'd have like 15, a 15 minute or a 12 minute segment actually on the bank. And, it, and, similar, just, just well, <laughs> yeah. and it, it wasn't going to be, it was still going to be tight lines, but it was going to be, we, we'd have that, that bit on the bank and we'd throw, we we produce links to the films we were going to show um, that week. And, um, you know, the budget would have been infinitely smaller. Um, I would have taken, uh, a, a, I was executive producer as well of Tight Lines, so so I, I would have been able to produce it as well, and and we could have run it with just one cameraman, didn't need a sound man really, um, and, and and a bit of bit of work inside, but no, that that I don't think that got carried to the uh, managing director with the same enthusiasm that I had for it, and and you know I was sixty nine, mate, I'm seventy four now, so I was you know yeah, I, I was. I was 69 yeah. years. So, you know, how much longer did I want to, how much longer would I have been viable? How much longer would people have been prepared to put up with this silly old git sitting there telling them how to fish? Well, they need to do for at least half an hour of my podcast. So let's hope so. <laughs> so that, well, that's, that's the tight line story. That's that's brilliant. I mean, you've, you've really sort of, there's a few things there I didn't know about for sure. I guess then moving on to, to the radio side of things. Oh, yeah. um, I, th- I, I th- Now it's all about relevance because this is still pretty sort of fresh, I guess, um, yeah. when, when you sort of moved away. The amount of people that say, you know, why did Keith leave? Um, what's gone on there? What's going to happen with it? You know, maybe Nigel's not as engaging because it's mainly Matt Chandler's and, and obviously that's not his area. Well, carp um, angles, a lot of carp angles. I mean, Terry Detention was a regular caller and Terry Detention is Terry Hearn. I mean, ter- yes. Terry, Terry phoned me quite regularly and and and... and New, uh, there were there were lots of, of, of very very good carp anglers used to phone me. Neville Ficklin used to phone him. Carp angler, of course, more of a, a, pike, a, a yeah. pike angler, more of a predator angler. But I, I got some written, and, and I I was the only one who knew who they were. Um, but you know there were some oh, some real superstars used to phone him. But the, Nigel changed the format as well. The format had to change because Talk Sport wanted it changed. But the, the potted version of that. Uh, first show was 20th of June, 1999. I was filming that morning in Scotland 
um, lock style trout fishing, got to Glasgow airport. My flight was cancelled. Um, tried to book on another flight, couldn't get on another flight. It was a British Midland. Um, eventually begged the person on the desk and she was shaking her head. She said, look, I'm shaking my head because other people want to get on this flight. So I'm making it sound very negative. Go through that door there and wait till I call you. So I did that. She called me. Yeah. I was on, I was in CA1. Well, there you go. So hey. that was all right. Um, and, and then I got to um, Heathrow, got the Heathrow Express to Paddington, got in a taxi. I said, I need to go 101 Oxford Street, mate, which is where Talk Radio was at the time. He said, you'll be lucky. Um, and who, I think the Stones were in Hyde Park on that day. So it was a big Hyde Park oh. concert. That I'm sure yeah. it was the Stones. Anyway, I eventually got to the show in time because it was an evening show then. And, and my guest was John Wilson. That's so, um, yeah, so, so yeah, that's how that started. And it, then it went to... They went over to a different studio. They made it a morning show rather than an evening show. Oh, did, a, did you find that was better to engage anglers? Because I know you used to get a lot of people ringing in when they're actually on the bank. Oh, yeah, you wouldn't yeah, have got that in the evening, would you? It went to a Saturday morning, Sunday evening, and then it went to Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and, and, and talk radio became talk sport. They moved to Hatfields, which is almost opposite where the Anglers Mo used to be produced. Uh, and um, it, uh, it was there until I quit. And I quit because they wanted me to go from six till eight in the morning to five till nine and getting up half past four and going to work is early in the morning getting up half past three to go to work is late at night yeah. and i was losing my best hour you know i would see the calls just go off the scale between seven and eight compared to six to seven you know i'd sometimes get joe from enfield phone up and you know doris from copper mill the various people that mostly duck when you're struggling yeah mostly yeah sadly are no longer with us some of those people crispy obviously yeah. is but some of those people are no longer with us and they made they made a character and this was bruno brooks advice he said you will get people who will become characters cherish them Keep on them on side. Keep them coming on the show because people will relate to them. And people now will say to me that, that they, they recognise my voice. People that don't go fishing even. I, I, I was talking to someone in, in the field. My wife's got a pony and I go and look after it and feed it and pick its poo up every day. And, and, and I got talking to this bloke. He said, I recognise your voice. Did you used to be on the radio? I said, yeah. He said, you that fishing bloke? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, What's happened to Joe from Enfield? Well, there this, you go. This, this was last year, like last year. I don't know how many years ago Joe jo from Enfield passed away, but it's it's. I was still doing the show, so and, and I quit in 2014. So they do remember those characters. It was great. Bruno gave me some great advice. It was him that told me, and I will pass this on to you now. Never assume you've got an audience. Only talk to one person at a time. And when I hear someone come on the radio and say, oh, hello, George. Hello, everybody. I want to strangle him. Because yeah. there's no way I'm on my own. There's no one listening in my car when I'm driving along. Well, you said that to me about my my little videos that I've tried to sort of dip my toe into. And I open up with, hello, everybody. You're like, well, we know that nine times out of ten, it's just some some blokes out there watching it on his own. Well, so why it? do you say hello, yeah. everybody? I get hello. it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that was great advice from Bruno. And, and but. I'm talking to you now, but if I was doing a recording of my own voice, I would be talking in exactly the same way. When I speak on the radio, I speak in exactly the same way. I've got no airs, no graces. I don't slow down. I don't, um, I don't comply. I say what I want to say, how I want to say it. And, and I've had some, some fantastic experiences. I did a few overnight shows at TalkSport, which were very good. And I, I tried to be devil's advocate, like I'd put up a, an argument. And when somebody came in and argued against my argument, I would, uh, they argued with my argument, I'd argue against them, like just being a devil's advocate. But I also yeah, right. had, I, I had two salutary experiences on early on Sunday morning. I was on air when the Sri Lankan tsunami struck. Yeah, um, Christmas time. Boxing Day. Oh, was it Boxing Day or Christmas? Boxing Day or Christmas Eve? Boxing Day it was. And and, and and you've got to be, like, you can't be hail fellow well met when things like that are happening because people are phoning in because it was, it was a sports station, but it was a sport news station. People were phoning in. And I was also on for when the um, oil refinery at Hamill Hempstead blew up. Oh, wow. A bit I close heard, to the as well. I heard the bang as I was going into the studio. And we did the whole two hours with virtually no fishing in it because my, my niece and, and at the time my sister were living in Hemel Hempstead. 
I got first-hand reports from them. Yeah. I had a, a bloke phone up and say, I'm really worried, Keith. He said, my uncle's delivering there today. He said, and I don't know whether he's made it or not. And his uncle phoned in and said he saw it explode in his rear view mirror as he was driving out. Yeah. Now, they're experiencing their life experiences, mate. And, and, and you know, I, I couldn't just say, well, I can't talk about them. I'm going to talk about, you know, fishing the far bank of the canal. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, yeah, I'm going to tell people how to put a big lump of crust on a size four when it's chub fishing in the winter. You know, and, and you can't do it, mate. And, and oh, we, no. we had a few occasions we used to get Sky News, do our news. And there'd be a few few occasions when people, the news, the, the, the line would go down or the present, and I had to read the news. And, and when I was at my, Fabulous school, Dame, Dame Alice Owen School for Boys. It's now a mixed school. When I was at Dame Alice Owen School for Boys, they said to me, what do you want to do? And, and you know, you've, you've, you've got to have – I couldn't say I want to be a carpet fitter because I was obviously in the wrong school. So I said, I want to be a newsreader for the BBC because I'm very, very good. It's something I'm good at, I'm, I'm as good at it as I'm as anything else, is reading out loud. Yeah. If you give me a piece of paper that I never, I've never seen before – Usually, I can read it out loud with context. How I do it, I have no idea. I can read a book. I, I, I would love to record The Old Man and the Sea. Charlton Heston got there oh, first. Yeah. But I would love to record a version of The Old Man and the Sea. One because of my favourite books. Exactly. Because I can just read it. And I can, you know, I'll pick up McCarthy's Bar. I'll open it at random page, page 196. I'm descending through clouds as I zigzag down the mountainside. Golden yellow ore, shiny from the rain, gleams through the rock that borders the road. I'm hoping for lunch, but Australia's celebrated Pacific Rim fusion cuisine may not have made it this far. See, I can just pick it up and read it like that. And I just did that. I, that I, I've never read that. I've read that page yet before, but never out loud. And I've not picked that book up for probably five or six years. But it's just using it to prop something up on, I think. I, I was no, it's, no, no. I couldn't do that. I've got uh, Ivan Marks and the Likely Lads is propping me mic up, and, and the Oxford Modern English Dictionary is yeah. propping up me, propping up my iMac. That's what um, my my. Uh, I've got a, an acoustic shield that goes between me and my computer um, to stop my voice bouncing off the screen. I've got a pop shield now, but uh, that used to stand on that because they're the exact right height. So I'm just I've I've got that talent, and I used to read out loud at school, and I won the school the Chumley Reading Prize. I won the school reading prize, so I had to read a lesson at the service of nine lessons and carols at um, uh, at St Mary's Church in Upper Street, where the Reverend David Shepherd was the, the the vicar at the time who opened the batting for England. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Name is so, about. Yeah, 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 a long time ago, mate. Well, well, that was in the, the um, probably the late fifties, I guess. Well, I guess then with talking about the past and coming into the present with these uh, vocal skills of yours and and all the ideas probably that you've still got to offer. I know you've you've, you've said a few times that you're a bit of an old uh, dodger nowadays. But <laughs> what what are, you, what are you up to? I mean, I know you're doing the podcast piece. I know you're doing uh, doing that. You've got some great guests, and I guess this probably where i got the inspiration to to try and do something myself but um you've got the gut get hooked on uh fishing concept yeah, I'm, that I'm, you're currently I'm, working with chair, i'm chair of trustees of, of that charity yeah. so um, it's about those two things then your podcast and the uh ghof well a podcast i was approached by a, a man who i who i respect a lot who was a, a great presenter on bbc radio who's now set up a business um Set production company and he does some work for tv but a lot of work for radio and for apps and things like that and he asked me if i'd be interested in doing it as a joint venture um if it makes money then it will make money if it doesn't make money then i enjoy doing it and he i enjoy doing these things anyway and, and he enjoys doing it and and it's given him um, another string to his his bow yeah and um so he asked me if I'd do it. He said, yeah, what do you want to call it? So um, Fisherman's Blues didn't go bad as a title for the radio show. We obviously can't use that. So I went to my one of my other favourite water boys track, Strange Boat, and decided to uh, to call it that. And, and and there is a line in it, line in it which, which appertains to all anglers, I think, carrying the strangest crew there's ever been. So I thought, yeah, it's... Um, ah, that you know, do. Uh, yeah. yeah, so 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 strange. Well, I can't use the music from it, unfortunately, because although I've tried to contact Mike Scott, he doesn't do direct messages on um, on Twitter. Um, but I, I, I've tried to see if we can use the music because I think Fisherman's Blues sold a few albums through um, through through being Fisherman's Blues on Talksport. I'm sure, yeah, you know, and, and that's why that's where I got the name from. I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm not hiding that. It was it was the Water Boys inspiration to call it fisherman's blues you know where uh where my name comes from for this podcast don't you go on go on 
two pints of maggots. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, two pints of lager and a packet of crisps, please. One of my yeah, favorite, exactly. One of my favorite Very much my, great actors. When I, yeah, when I was uh, when I was sort of growing up, you know, coming out of teens and becoming a man, if you like, um, all some real good memories. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a nice little play on words. Fantastic program. Well, good luck with it with the old um, the old oh, podcast. I, I know it's going something. well so far. Yeah. Yeah, it's going, it's going all right. For, um, get up to some fishing. Um, yeah, obviously, it's a real struggle with charities at the moment. One of our project um, managers, former project manager, has just been um, sentenced to um, a stay. Unfortunately, not as a Le- Majesty's leisure. He's been I was going to say, stay. where are you going with this? Well, he's been given a suspended sentence. He he defrauded one of our projects um, in quite a, quite a big way. And uh, he was um, sent down or sent out last uh, last friday so that's been a bit of a traumatic experience the we discovered the event the offense um 49 months ago oh that's sucky that's dragged its heels then well, it we, we have to report wow. it to the charities commission the charities commission made us report it to action fraud uk action fraud uk reported it to the police fraud squad they got involved in the october of that year they seized his his electronic digital equipment and and went through that and found loads and loads of damning evidence that we didn't even know about and um wow. yeah the, the 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 case has taken a very long time covid hasn't helped um but and, and covid you know any, anyway that that's what so it, it's it's very hard overcoming that problem but we have overcome it the work of our ceo sarah collins who basically runs it single-handed she does run it single-handed she, not does, basically. Yeah. she runs it single-handed has been unbelievable she's managed to keep the charity's head above water during these times um we, we get some funding from the angling trust from the environment agency via the angling trust for participation work we get some funding from school england for for, for working with disadvantaged people social inclusion is is what we do we're we're all about social inclusion and we get several groups coming to our various projects we've got one in scotland one in the northeast northeast of england one in west midlands and and and, um north aller fields in in ealing in west london um and we get crowds of children coming to them naughty children um you can tell they're naughty children because they've got 400 pound trainers um 500 pound track suits and um and and iPhone 11s and 12s, um, and you can tell how they've been naughty, um, some of them, and and we try and get them back on the road, and and we've done it. We've we've had several of our, our customers, if you want to call them that, um, have begun working for the, the charity. They've been um, they've become mentors. Uh, they've got work. We've, a couple of them have gone to work for the council. Several of them have got apprenticeships. Some have got apprenticeships in fishery management. Others in in more rudimentary basic skills. And um, there's obviously we probably had failures, but I can't tell you about those because I don't know about those because they don't tell you when they go to prison or do any get murdered or anything. But um, they, these are kids that are they're very unfortunate. They've been brought up in the wrong time in the wrong place by the wrong people and encouraged by the wrong people and 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 we it's a major job trying to turn them around um and and we've got some great staff some and i mean that some great staff and fantastic volunteers that all work the volunteers work for nothing um the staff work for minimum wage or not much more and and they do superb job and and, and if anybody's got any money they don't need get hooked on fishing would greatly appreciate it and is that just uh, we just Google that and you'll it'll come up? Yeah, we've got we've got a website. You'll see everything on there. We 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 are getting some donations. Getting funding is difficult because, of course, most people don't understand about charities. They can't make a profit. You can get donations and you can spend the donations on what you like, but funding is very different. So we will apply for um, the, the Mayor of London's fund. We got some money from the Mayor of London's fund and they had a specific thing to do with that money and we have to show them where we've spent every penny of, course, yeah. of that money. And you can't say, well, we took some out for management. No. You can't do that. You have to say, well, we did, you know, this, we, we did these... 85 kids they've we've given them all a whip we've we've got them all fishing they've all spent at least this time they've all got their cast awards they've all you know and and, and you have to give that and 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 justify your existence for funding and and you don't get any spare money you can't make spare money you, you so charities can't make a profit they can't make a loss and they can't borrow any money do you get any support from the tackle companies uh, yes um some um i i, I mean 
I suppose in a certain way, because I'm me, most tackle companies that I've phoned up have given me what I've wanted. Yeah, I was going to say, you can call in a few favours, can't I'm, you? I'm, I'm not very good at, at asking for things. Um, I, I, I've I've got some, I mean, there's, there's a guy just recently, he put on Facebook that he had, he makes floats, a chap called Ian Everett makes floats. And uh, he said, I've, I've got some discontinued things and some slightly damaged stuff and funny colours. Uh, any charity wants them. So I said, yeah, we'd like them. And, and loads of people criticise me, ask him because I'm me. They think I get everything you know, thrown at me for nothing anyway. Uh, no, and, I, know, and, I know you don't. Crikey. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. And, just, and a, Ian, just a normal bloke. He's not, you don't go around sort of lording it up saying, I want no, this, that and the other. Absolutely no, not. I don't think I've ever said, do you know who I am? Um, <laughs> no, I don't think you are. Not in my, not in my experience. Not <laughs> when I've been with you. But Ian, Ian sent us some stuff and it, it, it's fantastic stuff. And, and it means a lot to our charity. You know, we break a lot of pole floats. We break a lot of hooks to nylon. I, I mentioned to to someone about hooks to nylon uh, to to Gary Barkley at Drennan, and and I, I, I shouldn't. He he was very generous. I'm I'm not going to say it, it, there. Everybody I've asked I've asked diver for stuff. Glasgow Angling Centre Fishing Mega Store are fantastic to us. Um, they they give us brilliant amounts of they they do us silly prices on stuff or they give us give it to us for nothing. Um, and, but I don't like saying it because everybody else gets on their case. And we are, we're a special charity. You know, we are a special charity. We don't just get kids into fishing. Um, we don't just, you know, Les Weber's Angling Projects is a special charity, works in a very different way to ours. Hasn't been a charity for very long, actually, but, it, but he works in a very, and I support Les, he works in a very different way to what we do. Um, but, but it is, it's a special thing for angling to turn bad people into good people. Yeah, and and I think as well when you said before about you know there's been some great success stories and you wouldn't know about the balance. To be honest, I think if you had one great success story, that is better than 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 none whatsoever. Because you know, like you say, some of these environments that these kids must be growing up in must be horrendous. And even if it's just a day or two away from that, um, in in doing something that we all take for granted and we all love, it doesn't come easily for everybody. So I think it's brilliant. And and for the listeners, you know, if you want to check it out, just just give it a Google, yeah. get hooked on fishing. Thof.org.uk. Can, can I give you one, just one very quick example? Of course you can. I was, I was at North Hallow when I was volunteering and, and I got given two girls to deal with, 13, 14 years old, both, you know, Good fun. They were, they were, they were, they were up for a laugh. So um, I said to one of them, uh, "What do you do outside?" She said, "I play football." Really? She said, "Yes, I'm a goalie." And I was sure she had Queens Park Rangers. Oh right, yeah. Queens Park. But it was it was actually another park, Rangers uh, in in Surrey. So I said, "Oh, do you, you live there?" She said, "Yeah." She she was she had various problems, and she had to get a taxi from her home in Surrey to her school every day and a taxi home on her own because of problems that she'd had. And she came the next week. She, she wouldn't touch a maggot. She wouldn't touch a fish. By the end of the first day, she was unhooking her own fish and hooking her own maggots. And the second time she came, she was really up for it. I said, how are you doing? How's everything? She said, I've had to stop playing football. I said, oh, why? She said, my mum's kicked me out. No. 13 years old, living in foster care. Wow. And, and, my mum's kicked me out. And and she wasn't – her mum didn't kick her out because she was a bad kid. Her mum kicked her out because she wasn't a very good mum. And yeah. and there were other things that took priority in her life over her daughter. I can guess what as well, but we won't go into that. No. Yeah. So, you know, and, it, and it's that kind of thing. And we saw her a few more times and then she went to another school. But, but it's that kind of – when you hear those kind of stories, Dave, it tears your heart out. It really tears your heart out. And and how can, you know, when you think that fishing gave her a little bit of a focus for a few weeks, it took her mind out of what she was doing, away from what she was doing, and just gave her something else to concentrate on. Yeah. That's, that's what it. we do. That's wonderful. You know, and you can't put a price on something like that, but you need all the support you can get. Brilliant. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad we covered that because I, d- I didn't realise, you know, sort of uh, it was such a powerful story and, and that's that's great. All right. Well, I think we'll probably start wrapping things up a little bit. We've covered the past. We've covered yeah. the present-ish. We haven't caught fish plans- yet. Yeah, no, we, are. <laughs> we haven't. 
we're not we're not fishing what about the future and is there any plans i have you got any more irons in the fire you're just gonna is it you know feet up time and sort of time to sort of uh, wait for your covid vaccine sort of thing well, i've had that i've had my first one oh, um, top man. I, I don't i don't you know i'm, I'm open to anything I, I really am open to anything i mean p- people said we write another book i wrote a book seven years ago um i got stung by the publishers I, I won't be writing another book i enjoyed doing it i'm doing a little bit of um uh, I, I'm, I'm very good friends with keith elliott who produces a ma- magazine called classic angling which is a very high quality magazine that looks at fishing back over the the, the, the hundreds of years over the centuries oh, wow. and, and um, he sends me the odd book that i review um I, i've still got my angling times page which i enjoy the history bit I, yeah, I it's going well. The archives, great. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't just sit down and, and do what I did before and write saying I think all these people are mugs or I think these people are great. I now have to actually do some research, and because I'm, I'm incredibly, I don't actually know everything. Um, I have to look things up, uh, but then I look things up and, and pick what I think is interesting out of those facts and present them to people. I've discovered a man called Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's an astrophysicist. A name, and, yeah. Uh, well, yes, he, he, he's, you can have a look at him on YouTube. He's he's brilliant. He's an American astrophysicist, one of the most eminent scientists in the world, and he's taught me the difference between truth and facts and fiction, um, and you know how you must never confuse the two. He he actually told me this is a tip: the most unreliable evidence you can have is eyewitness evidence. Why is that? Because it's, it's not scientific. Subjective. Uh, yeah. It's subjective. Yeah. How many people you you will meet people that tell you they've seen a ghost? There are no such things as ghosts. <laughs> I see what you're saying. Yeah, yep. So there you go. No, no, fair enough. Future mate. I'm, well, hopefully when this COVID thing's over, and and yeah. uh, I've I've managed to get my wife, although it's closed at the moment, she does one day a week at a day centre, which is very good um, because it's a little bit of respite for me. I, I could get someone in, but I don't think that's fair somehow. You know, for you know, I would have to say, well, I'm going fishing next Wednesday, so I'll get someone in. And she doesn't enjoy having people in here. Um, she doesn't, you know, she's 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 her her, her, her she's got a hypoxic brain injury, and it behaves. It's vas- called vascular dementia. It's a bit like dementia, but it's different from Alzheimer's type dementia. It's it's mm-hmm. it's very different. Um, but she goes to a day centre once a week now. When it's open, it's just it's closed during this latest lockdown. I don't know when it's going to reopen, but that gives me. Six, seven, five, six hours on a, a Tuesday that I can nip out fishing. I can go down the river. I can go to North Alla and do some volunteering there. I'll do a bit of fishing there. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to maybe um, getting some help from from somebody, some like some family members maybe. And, and I'd, I'd love to have a day at Rutland. I'd love to have another day down at Diva Springs. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd, yeah, flies out. Yeah. yeah, it'd be nice to go fish here to expose my flies to the world. Um, it's, yeah, there's, there's um, yeah, that. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm not ready to start looking out what colour screws I want in the box, mate. Let's put it that way. Good, absolutely. That's 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 what I want to hear. Well, I think I want to sort of finish where and put you under pressure a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to ask you. Uh, we're going to call this six in six. So you know that was uh, six in sixty, should I say six in sixty? That was took me a long time to think of this, and it's six questions in sixty seconds. Mm-hmm. So um, as we know, you got at math, so you got ten seconds each uh, question, and I'm going to start. Now, so if you were armed with a rod and reel and a float of your choice, two pints of maggots and a packet of hooks, where do you go and what do you catch? Medley. Whatever swims. Lovely. Favourite place to fish? Key West, Florida. <laughs> and you could say that. Favourite fish species? If I can go there, it's going to be tarpon, isn't it? But if, if, if it's here, then I like catching roach, chub, dace, crucians. Yeah, I, I like roach, I suppose. Okay, one bit of tackle you could not do without. Hmm, blimey. Oh, that, that is, that's the toughest one of all because I like so many kinds of fishing. My favourite rod is a Diver Connoisseur Purple one, 13-foot Waggler version. I can't remember, TPW13W, I think it is. Tommy Pickering, Purple Connoisseur. Great knowledge. Uh, you enter the pairs match. Who's your partner? Uh, well, I fished a pairs match with uh, Rita Bell uh, from York Tackle some years ago, and we came second in the Jack purchased mixed Jack purchased mixed pairs. We were second, um, so yeah, Rita was Rita was a good partner. If, if any any other partner, then I'll probably have Lefty Crow and we go fly fishing for bonefish. Okay, and best angling achievement? Oh blimey, I don't know, mate. That's hard to say. 
Um, <laughs> well, you've run well over. We're on well, one I, the I knew you would. I've, I've, won, I've won the John Smith seven. I was second in the national. I've had second in so many big matches. And I don't know. Who knows? I, I knew you won't be able to answer that one because it's, it's such a sort of open question, I guess. But the Witchhaven one was a good one, wasn't it? Yeah, which I even, and that was with a barbell. The John Smith was probably better because I had some chub and I was next to Stu Conroy and I had some fish on the waggler as well. I, I, I had to set up a feeder rod with 20 minutes to go because uh, uh, pro- possibly anglers, angling's first transgender female um, convinced me to set a feeder rod up and I probably wouldn't have won it without setting the feeder rod up. And uh, yeah, that's, But that's the first transgender, somebody I admire a lot. They had the guts to go from man to woman having been a marine commando. Oh, wow. Crikey, that is a story. That's a, that's a story for another time. I think we've got another story for another time when we talk about a little bit. Um, I think you had something to do with uh, the development of feeders, or did you not? Yeah, block end feeders. Yeah, they started in in um, in London in the the old LIA days. That, that's that's a, a, a full story on its own. It is. It is indeed. So I think we're an hour in, and it's been an absolute pleasure, Keith. We don't get to speak enough. I know we chat on Facebook and bits and pieces, but yeah. we must do this again soon. So uh, I guess on a final note for the listeners, if you had one piece of advice, any <laughs> top tip, on, what would it be? Uh, what for, for fishing? Anything. No, I, I've given the advice, mate. Say yes. <laughs> That's fine. That'll somebody, do for me. Some, if you can say yes to somebody, say it because it will make them feel good, and it will make you feel good. Well, that will do for me. Thank you very much for your time, Keith. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome, mate. I'm not doing another one. Oh, all right, and I will. <laughs> say yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. For all your fishing needs, be sure to check out Fishing Evolution. Boasting two floors of branded displays, visit our recently expanded superstore at Hadley Road in Sleaford, where we offer a huge range of tackle from all of the leading course and cart brands, such as Nash, Fox, Corda, Drennan, Preston, Guru, Daiwa, and many, many more. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram, where we share all of the latest news and updates about products available in store. Okay, let's have a look in the tackle shed then and some of the reviews that have caught my eye in the angling press um, this month. Uh, First of all, I'd like to have a little look at Match Fishing Magazine, uh, where they're highlighting and showcasing a couple of seat boxes. I guess it's that time of the year when, you know, traditionally we'd have just gone through sort of uh, the trade shows tend to be towards the end of the year and and it's focusing on on what's coming out the following year and and, well the magazines have really gone for it and one that really caught my eye is this new range of Daiwa boxes Um, big chunky leg system 36 mil legs um, a decent draw system as well I used to have a Daiwa box Um, one of the things I didn't like about it was that the drawers were very very thin you couldn't even get like a you know a, a pack of shot in there without it sort of uh, scratching along the top and getting stuck so these look a little bit more deeper they've got trays in there as well he's done a water test and it's dan webb that's done that review and this box is called the d500 it's, it's rrp of about 550 quid which i guess versus um the likes you know if you have the the guru reeves and and all the rest of it it's it's pretty competitive it's up there with the matrix and Preston's etc and speaking of Preston if I jump from that dial one's on page 66 if you've got Match Fisher magazine worth a look on to the next one which is page 74 and I say this month they've really gone for the seat boxes and it's the new one from uh, Preston so it's an inception station 30 mil legs looks really cool looks quite light uh, I'd quite like to sort of get my hands on one of these just see how heavy they are because I think one of the problems with all these boxes nowadays, of course, is just the sheer weight of them when they're empty. This one claims to be 16 kilos when empty. So what's that? 30, 32, 34 pounds. So in theory, not, not too bad. But I guess once the winders are in there, etc., um, I'm not sure. But they both look really, really smart. And this one's coming in at 449.99, so 450 quid um for the inception so they both really caught my eye quite interesting so if you're on the lookout for a new box it might be worth a spy there um moving on to i guess tried and tested for myself what have i found uh this last month or so that's been a great buy or made any sort of difference i guess i'll start off with clothing and i've mentioned it on my facebook page and uh, not so long ago 
I used to have this matrix um, winter suit thermal suit. Brilliant. You know, t- it's lasted the test of time. I've probably had it about six or seven years. Worn it every winter. It's had some hammer. Um, and over time, I found myself, you know, the waterproof rating of, of these big thermal suits are not great anyway. So I was spending more and more money using Nikki wax and waterproof spray and all sorts. Anyway, it was taken out of my own hands because I, I split the bib and brace um, on one session. So I needed to get a bib and brace as a kickoff. So I thought, well, I'll keep the jacket and I'll, you know, invest in, in a bib and brace and not quite got the money spare to get full Gore-Tex set up and whatnot. And, and I wanted something thermal. So I came across and was looking elsewhere, just out of fishing. Um, you know, I was looking at go outdoors at Blacks, these outdoor type uh, stores. And actually, I came across this uh, Savage Gear, which is a, a Predator brand. And for those of you that do a bit of Predator fishing, I'm sure you've heard of them. I, I'd not, you know, I haven't got a clue when it comes to Predator gear at all. But it was a, a um, Heat Light was the name of the bib and brace. And you can see it's got like a silver reflective, almost like a foil effect um running through the bib and brakes i thought they'll do give them a go 60 odd quid i think i've got from out go outdoors um and you know what brilliant warm comfortable loads of pocket storage in the right place get your boots on easy enough um just just well designed i i thought well i guess predator anglers are on the move a lot um so it all makes sense so it was so good i actually flogged the thermal jacket stuck that on ebay got rid of that one and i bought the jacket uh, from Savage Gear as well. So I got the full setup for about, I think it's about 100 and, 150 quid, something like that, if that. 140 quid, I think, for the two. Um, and again, if I get sort of six, seven years out of it, like I did with my Matrix suit, great. But uh, this one feels even more robust and not as chunky as that Matrix jacket that I had. So that's one that I would highly recommend is the Heat Light Gear from Savage Gear. Next up, I guess, is some socks. So in my haste, I've got some seal skin socks. I've got some big, fat, chunky numbers. I've got all sorts that I've, I've worn over the years. But I was out and about, and I saw these new Preston Celsius ones. And obviously, you know, like you do, you fall for the brand, and they look smart, the blue, black. I think they were eleven ninety nine for these new Preston Celsius. And they're okay. However, again, in my other haste, when I was out and about, and I saw uh, just before Christmas some ski tech socks they're called ski tech north pole now preston socks 11.99 ski tech north pole socks five pound 95 half the price just as good uh but it's getting to a point the other week where it was so cold i actually stuck both pairs on um because it's been that freezing but that's just something i thought i'd throw in there uh winter socks Preston Celsius, they're fine. Nothing wrong with them at all. Um, but for half the price, the ski Tex ones are just as good. So that's an interesting uh, comparison for you. What else? Let's talk about rods. Um, so there's quite a cool little section in um, Angling Times. Every week it's called the Bargain Hunter. So tackle editor there, Mark Sawyer. It looks like he's sort of pouring over the net, um, you know, checking out different outlets for, for these sort of bargains or where there's big savings. And one really stood out for me, and it's it's a go outdoors offer uh, for a Daiwa Ninja 11 foot feeder rod. And I'm a big fan of the, the Ninja range. I've got two reels, uh, one in 3,000, one in two and a half thousand size. So pretty much anything from Daiwa is reasonable gear. Um, RRP 64.99 on offer, at go outdoors for £40.97. So, again, a really good spot there from Mark Sawyer. Um, and he's got some boots in there as well. They're called frost boots, and these caught my eye. Um, the word it says, these great boots won't just keep your feet dry. They'll also give you much-needed grip on slippery banks so you don't come a cropper. And I know all about that. Uh, they've got breathable lining with neoprene uppers and foam-insulated bottoms. And they are normally uh, 80 quid, 79.99 on offer, 49.99 at fishingtackleandbait.co.uk. So a couple of bargains there that, that Mark's sort of pulling out from different outlets, which is um, useful to have a look at. So it's Angling Times every every week. He's got that section in there. Um, another tried and tested thing from myself. I was after a new rod, 13-foot rod. I've got loads of, you know, probably got two or three uh, pellet waggler rods, 11 foot. I've got a 12 foot one for a, for a heavier float for, you know, distance chuck. Um, but I've only got one old school 13 foot waggler rod, which ironically, old Keith R, forgive me, a few years ago when he had some Daiwa kit that was surplus to requirements. It's still going strong. The old amorphous whisker, it's a brilliant rod, uh, but it's a heavy version. 
great for punching out big sliders or big wagglers, whatever. I just wanted something a little bit more finesse uh, for a bit more close in work, but I wanted something 13 foot. With a longer rod, a 13 foot rod, you don't find yourself having to, you know, punch as much or force a lighter waggler out. You know, you can get away with lighter lines and it's just, it's just scaled down. It's nice for this time here. Anyway, I didn't want to spend the right load of money. And um, I was scouring online. I had a look in, in the tackle shop and I really admire on a, the Drennan Vertex. That caught my eye. But over 100 quid, I thought, for something that I'm only going to use a few times a year, just, you know, can't justify it. So I come across this rod and I, I've not bought any gear from Leader for years and years. And I looked into it, I thought, well, Leader, let's think about Leader. They own Map, which are obviously a huge brand. They own Witchwood and a couple of others. So it's, it's got to be reasonable, surely. So I took a, took a punt on a rod called uh, a, a Leader Concept GT. Uh, they've got a, quite a wide range. They've got 9-foot bomb rod, 10-foot, 11-foot feeder rods. They've got pellet waggler rods. It's quite a, a big range of six or seven rods. Um, and I think it was £37 something like that including postage off of ebay i think so i wasn't expecting much at all but i tell you what i'm massively surprised that, you know when you compare the gear from sort of 20 years ago for the same sort of rod you'd be paying hundreds and hundreds of pounds um so pleasantly surprised when it comes to that that leader concept rod um something to check out if you're in in the market for a bargain and speaking of bargains there's something that just hot off the press recently that's just been released it's gone into tackle shops i'm sure it'd be in my my local shop at fishing evolution is the new range of preston rods and they are called ignition so i was scouring online the other day i saw a few of the guys from preston i think joe Carras and dead shit posted a few bits and pieces <coughs> excuse me and the ignition rods range from sort of £49 up to 65 Again, I think there's six or seven rods in the range covering all sorts of commercial work. And, and looking at the videos, looking at the play in action, they look decent. Again, something perhaps you might want to want to check out um, if you're in the market for a reasonable price rod. So what have we covered there? We spoke about boxes. We spoke about a couple of rods, um, socks, clothing. Let's talk about bait. So a real interesting one. Again, another launch that's uh, that's been sort of building up, I guess, and, and getting more and more popular is the Fuca range of baits. Um, I first saw them advertised probably about four or five months ago uh, with quite a quite a funky advert of this guy going into a tackle shop and you know, and then there's all this thing, sort of strange. Strange storyline to it where um, you know being ripped off for buying bags and bags of pallets and whatnot. And what he's done, long story short, is he's bought these couple of bags of Fuca. And the idea is, of course, you can feed it as well as on the hook, yada, yada, yada. So I thought, well, you know, like most bit of branding, I fell for it. And I got, I think, three bags off of Amazon for £5.75. And, and I've used them uh, now and then on the hook. There's a white, a red and a yellow that I got. Um, and I've used them a few times on the hook as an alternative to pellet. I've had a few fish. Um but I've never fed any. And, and when you watch all the adverts and, and all the sort of the, the spiel about the bait, it's all about, you know, feed and use on the hook. And that's the versatility, etc. cetera. And, and the reason why I haven't fed any is an interesting subject. And it's one that I've investigated a little bit is because are they classed as a pellet or are they classed as just a hook bait? Or, or what is the thinking? Because I've used them on venues where you've got to use fishery pellets. So I thought to myself, you know, it's a match. If I start feeding these fucas by hand, is somebody going to think I'm feeding pellets? Are they clusters? But how does it work? So I got really confused. Um, anyway, they've released a new black version as well. And I have bought a bag of them. And I think I will use these and feed them because they look perfect to accompany hemp seed. So next time I can get onto a river when we're allowed to travel you know, out of the area, I can go on a, on a river. Uh, feeding hemp, trying one of the black ones on the hook uh, because hemp can be a bit fiddly keeping it on the hook and this might be a solution and for the sake of, sake of a couple of quid it was it's worth a go so the fuca ones anyway as i say and i i've asked the question so i've gone and spoke to a couple of fishery managers owners whatever you want to call them and asked the questions so first of all i went to aaron aaron grantham um at lindholm lakes and i asked him the question and he said absolutely not you don't feed fuca at lindholm because they are pellet form the only thing that you feed, which is pellet form, are our fishery pellets. So we answered that 
pretty straight out of the blue and, and pretty sort of uh, robustly. So that was the end of that. Okay. Next, I spoke to Simon, Simon Bosworth at Docklow Pools. I asked him the same question. I said, Si, what do I do if I come down to the fishery and I've got these few pellets? Can I feed them? What do you class them as? And he said, nope. They look and feel the same as pellets. You can only use the fishery ones. However, you can use them on the hook. And, and uh, to be fair, Aaron said the same. You can use them on the hook, but you can't feed them. So it's a really interesting one with the fuca baits so what we're going to do is we're going to put these questions to our next guest um next week on the next uh, the, on the next podcast that we do we're going to have the absolute angling god that is mr tommy pickering and of course he's involved now with fuca baits so i'm going to ask him the question around the whole pellet versus feeding versus all the rest of it um and then see what he's going to say about fuca as well so there's a few bits and pieces that we've covered off in the tackle shed. Hopefully you found that useful. And uh, next time you're down your local shop and we can have a look around, then, you know, try a waggle of these rods or, or you know, if you can see that clothing I mentioned, then, then more play to you. Um, other than that, I'm afraid it's, it's shopping online and, and doing click and collect with your local shop at the minute until things get a little bit back to normal. But uh, we'll speak soon. And next week, uh, we're going to really look forward to having that good old chat with the ex-world champion and, and general all-round fishing legend, ex-England manager for the England feeder team, um, Mr. Tommy Pickering. So uh, hopefully you've enjoyed our two pints of maggots and a packet of hooks podcast. Cheers for listening.